Hello, welcome to our lecture about uh, public opinion, some socialization, and we'll talk a little bit about the media today as well. Walter Lippmann was a journalist and political writer from the early 1900s, and he exemplifies one way of thinking about public opinion and how much we should care about what people think on different daily political matters. Uh, his opinion was that America is full of people who have superficial and easily manipulated opinions. So from his point of view, you can't really trust public opinion. And if you're a leader, the proper role is to actually teach people what they should think, and that's what leading is. And his famous line is that men, meaning men and women, respond as powerfully to things that are not true, to fictions, as they do to actual facts. That if the story is good enough, people react just as uh, powerfully as if the story is, is true, and that can be really dangerous. On the other side of this debate is a guy named George Gallup, who you may recognize from the famous polling organization, the Gallup Poll, which is cited all over the place. So he came up with some systematic scientific methods to measure public opinion. And his opinion is that we need to know what people think all the time. That's what a democracy is. And so it, from his point of view, polling and understanding what daily public opinion is is going to be a really big and important contribution to how democracy works. Um, and so those two opinions, Lippmann and Gallup, they sort of are as an example of the two ways of thinking about the two extremes of how we think about public opinion. Should we listen to it? Should we not listen to it? And how much should presidents base their decision or congressmen base their decisions on what the public thinks at the moment? And we know that the public opinion changes every so often. Uh, but anyway, how you come to have opinions about politics and how the nation comes to have opinions uh, is through a process called political socialization. And here are the main factors in how you become socialized to politics. Uh, the big point about all of these is that political socialization is a very indirect process. It is unlikely that at some point in your life, you wait till you're, whatever, 17, somebody sits you down, explains to you all the possible options, all the opinions, all the logical possible solutions to problems and says, okay, now you decide, are you conservative, liberal, Republican, or Democrat? It happens in very indirect and messy process, and that's why we call it socialization. So the first factor is family, and this is generally the biggest and best predictor of your personal politics. Again, you probably did not get sat down at age 17 at the dinner table and informed by your parents, here's how we vote, Here's what we think about politics, but you pick up little social cues from your family your whole life. Maybe from the age of seven you heard your dad grumble about affirmative action, or you've seen your parents react to people on the TV and go, oh, liberals, or oh, look at these crazy conservatives, and you pick up these little social cues. Uh, family is a really powerful socializing factor. With about 80% predictive rate, I can decide uh, what your politics are. I can guess. In other words, for most people, if your parents are both Democrats, there's an 80% chance you're a Democrat. And if your parents are both Republicans, there's an 80% chance you're a Republican. Um, that's nice in some ways. You'd like to think that children take the values of their parents and that lessons are, are passed down through the generations. On the other hand, we would prefer people to make up their own mind about politics. Otherwise, we have a bunch of zombies out there voting just because that's what their dad did. Uh, depending how you get educated, we pick up different social cues through education. Uh, from the day you were five or six or whenever it is you start schooling, you raise your hand and you vote on things in the classroom and you learn about democracy through all these indirect methods throughout your life. The media obviously shapes what you learn about politics. We have some basic societal values that are true uh, because you're an American or because you live in North Carolina, or because you live in uh, a civilized part of the world. And major events shape our political socialization. Think about um, my grandparents' generation, people who are about uh, 80 today. Think about their opinion of government. They lived through the Great Depression, where the government responded with the New Deal. They lived through World War II, where the government led a war effort against the Nazis. They have a pretty positive opinion of what the government is and what it can do. 
And then their children's generation, the baby boom generation, had a very different experience with government. They had Vietnam, they had Watergate, a lot of things that made them skeptical of the government and see the government as a pretty bad and negative thing. So major events really shape the overall public opinion. And we have certain members of society who are able to influence large amounts of people that we call opinion leaders. Uh, these don't have to be politicians, though very often politicians are opinion leaders, but people like Oprah, John Stewart, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, these are all people who are able to influence the opinion of millions of people, really. We know if we're going to make up our own minds about stuff and be a democracy, we need to get some information. And a free media, a free press, is a really important piece of our puzzle in trying to have a democratic nation. Often we wonder if the media is obligated, because of the role they play in society, to actually provide us with the information we need. Um, often this question arises when we think about how much crappy news we get, things about, I don't know, Kardashian babies, uh, compared to the actual real news that goes on in the world. Now they do that, of course, because that's what sells. Uh, and so we get into this kind of vicious cycle of wondering, well, whose fault is it that we do not get a lot of good, hard news delivered on a daily basis? We get an awful lot of just scandal and silliness and probably not enough good information for average citizens to make smart decisions about how to govern our nation. Who do we blame for that? Is it the people's fault? Do we blame media? Well, the media is just selling what people will buy. Uh, it's a difficult philosophical question to answer. Before the 1800s, most newspapers were run by uh, private organizations or parties. 1833, we see the New York Sun, which is the first penny press. Penny press means they charged about a penny per paper, which they took a loss on. You can't make money charging that little. Just like today, you can buy a newspaper for 25 or 50 cents. The newspaper doesn't make money off the circulation costs so much as they make money off the advertising they can sell because they have wide circulation. So this penny paper is the beginning of the wide mass circulation, which is the basis of our press and has been for ever since then. We've got two basic forms of media. We have print, magazines, newspaper, and we have electronic, TV, radio, and the interwebs. The media covers different pieces of the government in different ways. The president and the executive branch is pretty easy to cover. There's one guy. You, you hang out at the White House, you talk to his staff, you get inside information, and you report it. Congress is a little more difficult, because there are how many people in the House? That's right. 435, right. <laughs> and in the Senate, there's 100. That's 535 people milling about on Capitol Hill. That's pretty tough to cover. So the media tends to cover whoever's leading a piece of legislation or the leaders, like the speaker and the minority uh, leader. Supreme Court doesn't get quite as much coverage unless there's a major decision going on, and even then, we do not currently allow cameras in the courtroom, so we don't get quite as much coverage as we might otherwise. We're going to take a look at um, some more campaign ads when we actually get to our chapter on campaigns and elections, but it's important to pause and think about the impact of television on the average American's political understanding and the average election and campaign season that we have. Uh, this link here takes you to a YouTube copy of a fa really famous campaign ad uh, during the Lyndon Johnson campaign that really only showed for a night or two before it had to get taken down because it was too controversial. But uh, it shows you the power of imagery that really fundamentally changed how uh, media covered politics and how politics used media in campaigns. So, tell me. How is media biased? Uh, since about 1980-some-odd, we've been hearing a pretty constant barrage of critique at the media that it is biased, uh, almost meaningless at this point. There's so much claim of bias that nobody is trusted, and we have a really hard time sharing objective facts, but we'll talk about that in a moment. The first main hypothesis is that the media has a liberal bias. There's a number of, uh, we'll go ahead and make this true for the sake of argument, there's a number of factors we could point to here. One, most journalists are liberal, or at least more liberal than the average American. They're far more Democrats than conservatives. Um, this is obviously not true on Fox News, but overall the media 
has more Democratic journalists than Republican journalists. Also, the nature of the media is to uncover things that are going wrong and try to find scandal and try to change things. That is by nature a progressive or liberal activity versus a conservative or status quo activity. So that makes it more likely that a journalist would would perhaps lean towards progress or scandal or something new happening, which is technically more liberal than conservative. Uh, sometimes people make the mistake of saying, well, the media shows a lot of things like drugs and sex, and those are liberal things, but that's that's a really that's a that's a misunderstanding of what liberal and conservative means. Uh, how uh, drugs and sex happens, how the the issues are covered, well, that would be either with a liberal bias or a conservative bias. But the fact that drugs and sex are shown is not inherently liberal for any reason. There are some who argue that the news media has an inherent conservative bias. So whereas most journalists may be Democrats, almost every editor and owner of newspaper is very conservative, and they control what stories are shown ultimately. Also, we have a for-profit model in our media system, meaning all of our media runs as a business trying to make money. And to make money, they have to sell ads. And so they can't really afford to be too anti-business, because then business will stop buying ads. Say there's a scandal at Walmart in your CBS, and Walmart buys four million dollars worth of ads every few months. Well, how negative a story do you really want to play about Walmart? So the for-profit motive also has kind of a pro-business conservative bias built into it. Our media has a pretty strong pro-American bias, meaning more than 95 percent of the news the average American sees, meaning uh, more than 95 percent of the topics covered happen in America. Uh, now obviously the whole world has news going on. There's news happening all over the planet and 95 percent of the news on any given day is not happening in America. So that's a it's a fairly large pro-American bias. We care a lot about ourselves. Uh, for In contrast, if you ever watch the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company's news, as, just as an example, they'll have about 50-60% of their coverage will be things going on around the world and about 40-50% stuff happening in Britain. Uh, that's a slightly less nativist kind of media, but we have an incredibly nativist or pro-us uh, media bias. Often we point out that the media covers a lot of things that are bad more than they cover good news. People say, well, why can't you so show the good things happening as much as you show the bad? Um, again, this is part of our question of whose fault? Who do we blame? Do we blame the viewers? Do we blame media? People tune into bad news. Bad news gets better ratings than good news by a landslide. Uh, that's probably partial, partially natural, right? Their survival instinct is on the lookout for things that might kill you and things that are bad for you. So probably more likely you pay more attention to potential hazards in your world. We also claim uh, media has sort of a horse race bias when it comes to an election. They spend far less time covering the actual issues than they do covering who's ahead and what's the strategy of the game. It's almost as if media turns it into a sport to get higher ratings, and that is a bias as well. We have different models for how to run our media. Our media in America is overwhelmingly private, meaning for profit. And there are pros and cons to that. Um, the major drawback is that we don't get any news that is is not influenced by ad dollars or businesses, corporate interests. So there are some who would argue we would do better to have a bit more public coverage, stuff that is funded by the state. Of course, if you fund too much of your news by the state, then you have propaganda, you have state news, and that's not much better than corporate news, really. So we would like to have some kind of balance. Right now we have kind of an overwhelmingly private corporate media.